All right. There's no echo. Okay. I'm the director of marketing for Recruiting Daily. Thank you for joining our special panel webinar today on interviews. You're taking a look at our title slide, and we promise to jump right in soon. But before we get started, you have to give me just one minute to go over some tips for using GoToWebinar, and then I'll hand it over to kick things off. Quick agenda. I'm going to talk for a little bit. We're going to give a big shout out to our sponsor. We'll kick it over to our panel, and then we'll do a quick Q&A. <laughs> All right. Now, I say this every time. I feel like a flight attendant giving safety instructions. But for those of you attending a webinar for the first time, you should probably listen up. For those of you who aren't, I'm sorry. Uh, first, audio. By default, you've joined listening through your computer's speaker system. If you'd like to listen to the webinar using your phone, find the audio pane on the right side of your screen and select Use Telephone. If you hear any choppiness in your sound, it might just mean that your internet is slowing down, and that's a great time to switch over to the phone because you'll be able to hear everyone a lot more clearly. Uh, second, how you participate. All of you are in listen-only mode in plain English. That means you will not have the ability to speak directly with our presenter during the webinar, but you can ask as many questions as you want. Please don't be shy. In fact, I'd love if you just went over to the question panel right now and shot me a quick hello just to test it um, or shoot me any questions that you have and have right off the bat. Uh, and at the end, we'll do a live Q&A, time permitting, and take as many questions as we can. We'll be sure to provide responses to all the questions we can't answer after the webinar. Um, and don't worry, if you can't stay until the Q&A, we'll send you the recording of this webinar within 48 hours of this event. Now, we have to give a big shout out to our sponsor, Lever, who made this webinar possible. Uh, and you can follow them on Twitter, at Lever, or you can follow the conversation from our side, at Recruiting Blog, but both of us will be tweeting with hashtag RDaily. All right, now please pardon us as we all click on our cameras because you're going to watch our panel today, which is really cool. Um, so, speakers, kick on the panel. All right. Perfect. Um, and I'll keep that screen down at the bottom so everyone can keep track of the Twitter name uh, and the hashtag. And you can also see each of their Twitter names uh, in the little box on the left of each of their pictures. And now I'm going to be quiet and let Jack talk. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're really excited to be speaking with you today. Um, I'm excited to introduce our panel. First off, I'll be moderating. My name is Jack Foster, and I am the Director of Demand Generation Marketing here at Lever. Um, we also have Derek Steller, who is a recruiting consultant from the Virtus Group. He's bringing over 16 years of experience from the recruiting industry um, and has deep experience in both the federal and commercial space. So excited to talk with you today, Derek. Um, we also have Holland Dombeck. Um, she is currently heading up employment branding at Cox Enterprises, so I think we're going to have a really interesting uh, point of view in terms of how employment branding fits into the interview experience, so welcome, Holland. And we Hi. have our very own, oh, hello, we have our very own Leela Srinivasan from um, Lever, and she's our chief marketing officer and has a lot of experience, um, background in talent acquisition, and I think describes herself as a nut. Uh, when it comes to all things recruiting. So, <laughs> all right, well, let's, um, let's kick off then and jump right in. So I have a stat that I wanted to share with the audience today. Um, in a survey from LinkedIn, a talent survey from LinkedIn in 2015, there's a statistic that everybody says 83% of talents say that a negative interview experience can change, the, can change their mind about a role or company they once liked. So that's kind of setting the stage for why interviewing is so important. Um, keep that in mind as we go through this. So with that, the first question to the panel, panelists. Um, so we've all been part of a bad interview experience, I'm sure. What are we doing today? What are you guys doing today to actually coach hiring managers so that you can implement positive um, interviewing experience at your organization? And Colin, I'd like to, I'd like to kick off with you. Yeah, uh, so Holland Dombeck, Employment Rating Specialist at Cox. And so at Cox, our recruiting team is a shared service model, and we recruit for four divisions and about 100 sub-brands within those divisions. And so if 
it's really hard for us to take a one-size-fits-all approach to interviewing. And so our recruiters or our service delivery team really rely on our HR and business partners within those sub-brands and those divisions to develop hiring guides that are specifically tailored to not only a function, but a career level. And so they work really hand-in-glove with them to develop these resources, and then they walk their hiring managers through each particular guide. And so because a hiring manager may not use the same guide time over time, they embed them in a meeting invite. They have a kind of pre-session with the hiring manager to really help them understand the guide, the skill sets that they're going to be looking for, how each question aligns to the skill sets, as well as some of COPS's internal or competencies. Um, additionally, we, we also give some love to our candidates. Um, so some candidates may not be as familiar with the interview approaches that we take internally, and so we want them to be equally prepared as our hiring managers, but can be really a fruitful two-way conversation. And so in some instances, we send our candidates a similar guide over what to expect to cover during the interview so that they have some extra time to prepare responses and really recall experiences to share with the hiring manager to help uh, sell them or sell themselves into that opportunity. That's really interesting. Um, and it sounds like you're prepping hiring managers extremely well as well as the candidate for what, what they can expect in the process. Um, I want to ask, what's your kind of quick tip if you could give hiring, or I'm sorry, if you could give um, everybody on this call just kind of like one takeaway in terms of what they can do for coaching hiring managers, what would you say, your quick tip? So uh, I'm going to give kind of an employment branding angle from a branding standpoint. I think it's really imperative that recruiters as well as hiring managers are speaking about the brand in the same way. They need to be communicating the organization, the environment, core values, um, all within the same framework. And the message that a hiring manager is communicating during interview really needs to model what the recruiter said during an initial phone screen or it needs to be reflective of what is out on a career site or various recruitment channels. And so I really recommend if you're using some type of template or script or guideline that you incorporate some of those key facts about your business into that template so hiring managers have them as a quick reference in terms of the things they want to highlight to help sell the organization over maybe a competing organization to that particular candidate. Great tip. Thank you so much, Colin. All right. Yeah, um, you're welcome. Please. Yeah, well, we have more for you a little bit later. So, um, Leela, let's jump to you. If you could take us through what we're doing at Lever to coach hiring managers, um, that would be great. What are some tips for training, materials we're giving to interviewers? Sure. Well, I'll start with my uh, PSA slash jump speech, which is, it is shocking, shocking how little is done to train hiring managers in the average company. Uh, I've certainly worked at places where we've done things like roll out uh, Lou Adler's performance-based hiring manager training. Uh, I've worked at places where there's been no training at all. Uh, at Lever, we're obviously a much smaller organization than Colin um, talking about. So we're about 80 employees today, but growing, you know, adding, basically doubling every six months right now. Um, I think one of the interesting things that we do, and this comes back to Lever's roots uh, in uh, design thinking, is uh, we actually run design thinking workshops for an entire organization. Um, and these are um, sort of one and a half, two hour uh, sessions that um, train all of our employees to basically interview better, whether it's interviewing customers for case studies or candidates for uh, interviews or even, um, even you know, talking with prospects. It's about asking better questions that really get to the root causes and help you understand the why behind the responses. And I think that's where a lot of interviewing falls short today. Uh, you know, you, you ask the candidate a question, they give a very impressive sounding, uh, confident response on something that they've done. And I find that not, not enough interviewers go deeper and really seek to understand actually what was happening, what that individual candidate drove and so forth. So I find that that design thinking mentality is really trying to understand the pain points, the root causes, really what was going on underneath the surface has uh, helped me and my team uh, to become better interviewers. So that's one thing I think we've, we've done a little bit differently. In terms of um, some of the materials that we give to interviewers, we're going to talk a little bit later about sort of interview kits and how do you make sure that you're uh, encouraging your team to ask, uh, ask the right questions. Once, they, once they've got that, uh, a, better, uh, a better approach to actually asking the questions themselves and digging deeper. 
Um, one approach that's been very successful for us on the marketing team here at Lever is having candidates uh, give a presentation as part of their on-site um, on experience. And you know, typically it's maybe the ask them to prepare 20 to 30 minutes of presentation and allow 15 minutes for, for questions. And that allows us to really go deeper on their experience and um, encourages our, gives our interviewers, a, a, I think, a chance to really understand the candidate's skill set and talk about a very real world scenario where they've made a difference. Um, but also subtly dig around to understand the dynamics in the situation and understand, I think, on a different level, whether they're a good cultural fit for Lever, because we're an exceptionally collaborative organization. And so that's been a, a technique that's been very useful for us. Um, in terms of a quick tip, I would say, obviously, I'm sitting here as a hiring manager, although I've worked alongside uh, talent acquisition for many years now. But I think um, I would encourage uh, recruiters to work with their hiring managers and have them look across the entire interview process. Uh, we're going to talk later, and by the way, I should just a spoiler alert, me and Colin are completely joined at the hip mentally when it comes to employer branding yeah. and the uh, candidate experience and the interview process being you know, really part of the same discussion. Um, but, as, you know, as, aligned with that, it's really important to look across the entire slate of interviews that an individual candidate is going through, because really that's going to speak volumes to them about the, the um, company. And equally, as interviewers, you want to be delving for different information every step mm -hmm. of the way, not uh, asking an, you know, a, a poor candidate the same question five times in one interview panel from five different interviewers. And so my tip would be just to kind of take that step back and think about <laughs> what you need to fundamentally understand about that candidate know for the right fit for the role, and then make sure that you get complementary questions flowing across your interview process so that you not only get to the heart of what you need to understand, but you also deliver a much better experience for your candidate. Awesome. Thank you, Lila. Um, all right, Derek, that means we're on to you. So could you tell us about um, some advice that you would give to coach hiring managers today and, and add on to what Holland and, Lisa, and Lila have said? Um, one of the main things I do with my hiring managers is let them know that uh, as the, the interview is progressing, if they like the candidate, they should start selling the position to the candidate. Um, not just selling our, our company and, you know, we, we have our company culture, but what the candidate can expect at, on, the, on the position, what they're going to be doing their first day, what they'll be doing their first week and their first month, what the expectations are set, and really get the candidate excited that they really want this job. It helps me, at the end of the day, close. Um, I mean, I believe in the pre-close, and usually my candidates, 99% of them are already closed, but it helps that the candidate walks out saying, I really want this job. And, and I've actually had that. Candidates actually tell me that as I walk them out at the end of the interview, and it not, it's not always who's going to hire them, but uh, it makes it real easy when I go talk to the hiring manager and says, Let, let's, let's, get, uh, let's get Sheila on board, and I can literally walk over to my, my desk and call Sheila as she's driving home saying, hey, congratulations, we want to start you in a couple of weeks, so I'll get you a formal offer if you, in a, you know, accept my verbal. Um, managers need to think that way sometimes. I think sometimes they think that they're supposed to be some kind of gatekeeper. And at this point, we've already done my screen. We've done a technical interview. So at this point, it's more of a personality fit. Do you, will you fit the team? Will you fit the group? Will you fit the company? And if you are, then we should start selling right there and there. And what about a quick tip? Do you have one as well to share? Quick tips. Um, one, of the, one of my pet peeves is managers running late. Um, so my suggestion is always to set up the interview time 15 minutes earlier. So that way your manager's got a 15 minute window of uh, I'm running a little late so the candidate's not sitting in an empty office or an empty room or a giant conference room by themselves with about 30 chairs surrounding them. Um, so my tip to recruiters and managers is never have the candidate sit by themselves. Uh, if the manager's running late, then the recruiter should be in the room with them, chatting them up, getting them kind of not so nervous, I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, when people go into a room in an interview, they're nervous. They're going to be, you know, nobody's a professional interviewer. So I always say, you know, uh, my tip is to always make sure the candidate's got, you know, water. They've got, uh, they, they feel comfortable in the room. They feel comfortable in the, in the conditions of what's going on. Yeah, I think remembering the small details and the logistical things like that is actually a really big part of the overall candidate experience. Um, so it really is. I mean, I think sometimes we overlook certain small things where we're just so, we're right. just so you know, excited, like, you know, a new, like a new puppy or something. It's like we're, we, 
we got to we got to make sure that the minutia of the detail is, is always being looked at as well. Yeah, yeah. So thank you. Um, well, if you could dive in a little bit more, I know we wanted to talk about metrics and how you can actually pressure test some of some of these plans that we're talking about. Um, and Derek, I'd actually like to continue with you. Uh, what what metrics what metrics should practitioners actually be tracking? Um, how do you think about metrics in terms of interviewing? Dive in a little bit there for us. Metrics and interviewing. I, you know, I always say we're not a, we're recruiters, not accountants. So I'm not a really big numbers metrics guy. Sorry, I'm not. Um, when it comes down to the recruiting for the interview process, if we get into the game, um, I actually look at okay, we interviewed these three people or these four people. What set that one person apart? Um, and what are we going to do with the other? Let's say we have four people. One person gets the job, but the other three were good. So I always like to call them uh, like a silver medalist, uh, someone that didn't quite get the gold medal. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're not good for the company. That doesn't mean they're not good for another position. So I've always used that as a skill. As to, um, and I was talking with uh, some managers yesterday about this. I have on occasion run over to a different department and said, hey, listen, we've got uh, Jack here. And he's not going to be quite the fit for for this particular group. But I know you guys have been looking for something like this, too. Do you have 10 or 15 minutes to come run over and meet Jack since Jack's already here? And more managers than not will say yes. Uh, in fact, I've even set up a situation where I kind of have that feeling going in that this person isn't 100% fit, and I'll let the other managers know. So that gives them the opportunity to come in as well. It's good for us, and it's good for the candidate, because that means the candidate doesn't have to come back for yet another interview, especially if they're working and they got to take time off. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a time saver, and, and a lot of times candidates are like, wow, this is really cool. I got to meet with a couple of different people and make a decision. So I mean, that's what I do from a metric standpoint, I guess. I guess I suppose just to, just to play devil's advocate a little bit, I think there is uh, an onus on recruiting teams to really understand that there are conversion rates and funnels these days. Mm -hmm. but, um, yes. To your point, Derek, I think it's actually, from a hiring manager perspective, again, it really comes to life when you then take that metric discussion and then bring it down to the level of the people. So, for example, if you've had... Uh, you know, 27 applicants and brought four on site and none are advancing to the offer, um, you know, so that's one metric. Uh, but then when you actually, that becomes meaningful only when you double click on who those four are that came on site and understand why they didn't make the grade. Because then that forces you to change your interviewing um, process or tactics um, so that you can uh, hopefully get to the right people or a bit earlier in the, earlier in the game. So I think you actually do. You know, I would say you do need to have a, a firm grasp of the, how you're faring in the, in the conversion game, but really, again, be able to instantly bring it down to the level of candidates to get the hiring manager's attention. Mm -hmm. I also think there's an obligation, um, just from the candidate experience side, in terms of how quickly are you following up with them, what is really the length between maybe their first interview and that final conversion. If you know someone is going to be a silver medalist right from the gate, then they just need to be told they're silver medalist and then kind of carve that number back so they're not waiting for a couple of weeks on end to find out that they're not a fit for your organization. So I think that there needs to be some tracking around that candidate correspondence level as well. All very interesting, and I think actually all very applicable, you know, to the entire process. You have kind of collaboration and what Derek is talking about in terms of candidate experience on site, you have Vila, you know, bigger picture metrics, and then Holland, how are the metrics you should be thinking about when it comes to the actual candidate. So, thanks, guys. All right, we're going to switch topics a little bit. Um, let's actually dive into, like, some of the actual questions that interview interviewers should be asking. Um, Leela, I know that we talk a lot here about behavioral interviewing, so what is, what exactly is a behavioral interview type of question and how does this difference, yeah, you know, how is this different than maybe like a hypothetical type of question that you can ask in an interview? I'm actually, I'm laughing because I just realized I interviewed Jack, so you realize Jack is on my team. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you are going to be backing me up on this or like shaking your head. <laughs> so, um, so I think, you know, the industry as a whole is, I think there's Consensus that um, behavioral interviewing really helps you to get to the heart of the candidate's um, skill set. Really, because what, what we're backing is, do they, you know, does their past performance and application of skills uh, make them the right fit for this future opportunity? And so, um, for us, that's a question of really going deep into helping, uh, uh, having them explain to us situa past situations they've been in, past projects they've worked on, and 
really is, is a sense of intimately understanding the mechanics of uh, you know what was involved in that project. How you know, what was your role specifically? How did you set that up? What happened? Um, so I don't know what went well, what didn't. How did you uh, interact with different folks on the team? What were the sticky moments and so forth? So I think what it does is it helps the candidates speak from true experience. And you know, of, of all the people in the room, you are going to be the you, the interviewer, are going to be the one who knows the position and what's required of it better than the, the candidate. So then expressing to you their skills and how they use them will give you a chance to really uh, sort of think mentally about how those skills then map to the, the role. Um, while also observing the way that they behave and um, sort of picking up on whether or not they are the right fit is a culturally aligned with your organization. I think those things become um, quite apparent over the course of a behavioral interview because you're really, again, hearing the candidates speak in their own language about um, you know, the specifics of a project that is near and dear to them. And um, one thing, actually, even I think it was uh, last week I was talking to a candidate and um, you know, going back to this, this idea that some people just interview really well, right? And they can give very, very uh, cohesive and, and professional and polished answers at surface level and describe situations that they witnessed as sort of a, 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 a peripheral participant. But if you do, if you, if you run a behavioral interview well and, and kind of go deeper with those questions, then you're going to very quickly understand and uncover, you know, how deeply were they involved? What was their specific role? And so this interview last week, I had a candidate tell me about two internships that they had done um, where they had uh, a couple of different projects in each. And I wanted to delve into each to really understand their role. And uh, we very quickly got to the fact that in the first project that she described, um, she really hadn't been super involved. She couldn't speak coherently to the details. And that was fine. You know, I didn't sting her for that. She just didn't imply that she was integrally involved. But we then very quickly moved on to that second project and went much deeper on her uh, her role, her responsibility, how it played out. So for me, I find that helps me very quickly get to the, the, the you know, the guts of whether this is the right candidate for us. Hypothetical, you know, it's sort of one of those things where, on the one hand, there's a place for it. Uh, so I'll give you an example. Uh, in interviewing for uh, 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 an event marketer that came in for us, um, I basically asked her to sort of real-time whiteboard out some of the things that we should be thinking for as we prepare for our upcoming customer summit. So it's not exactly hypothetical, but it's, it's giving me a chance to see how she thinks in a situation that she's unfamiliar with. Um, so I think there's, some, there's something to be said for that approach where we're really looking for a critical thinker that can help us cover all the bases. And uh, I was looking for evidence that she would be a structured thinker that would really kind of tackle things systematically, and she was. Um, but if we talk about hypothetical questions, what would you do in such and such a scenario? Again, it's very, it's very easy for a polished interviewer in particular to give an answer that sounds impressive. Um, and it's hard to know exactly how to delve deeper on that. It's also hard for you as an interviewer to know, you know what's the right or wrong answer in that situation. So I find that actually probing on their experience leads to a much more, uh, much more useful discussion. Yeah. Great, thank you, Lula. Um, Derek, I'd like to ask you, what is an example of a bad interview question? Or Derek or Holland, either of you. <laughs> an example of a bad interview question? Yeah. Um, well, there's obviously questions that you're not allowed to ask just because of the EEOC. <laughs> Any of those questions would be bad questions. Um, I don't know. I kind of, you know, the whole personality testing questions, the whole Jungian Meyer Briggs thing, still mm -hmm. being thought process is just a little wasted on me. Um, I like to people just to get them to talk. I, 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 you know, I don't want to not answer your question, but I, I think that bad questions are sometimes the things like, so, you know, have, but what, what, problem have you had that you had to overcome and how did you overcome it for example um i actually wrote a piece on this that and i got a, uh, an answer i wasn't expecting um and it was I, it, it floored me and i won't get into it but sometimes you have to be cautious of the questions that we ask because there, there are some people that don't have filters or they don't interview well so they might be giving you some information that you realize out, out of turn that you're receiving that you're technically breaking the law um, because they start oversharing. So I try to keep people more on like, you know, what, my personal favorite question is what is what is your stress reliever? You know, how do you relieve yeah. stress? You know, um, because that's important uh, in, in, in my business. We're in a you know, highly cleared space. 
uh, doing cybersecurity. This is very detailed work. Um, it is not uncommon for someone in my in my space to work you know ten hour days uh, to, in order to get that contract filled because we, you know we have a t- we have timelines and deadlines all the time. And I look for that. I want to know what do you what do you do? What do you, how do you how do you blow off some steam? I mean you know it's uh, you, kickboxing, you weightlift, you run, you bike. I mean personally, I drink. Um, but you know it's a that was a joke. Um, I actually said that in an interview once, and I got the job. I still can't understand how that happened. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, those are I think some of the off-board questions that we don't ask. Like, I'd like to know a little bit about you personally too. You know, what what do you do for stress relief? What do you what do you do for fun? You know, what do you what do you like to do? What do you what, what you know? What is what are you outside of the office? Because I want to know the person, and that's going to tell me the personality of the person. If they they tell me that. They do like to run, or they do like to stay home. Oh, cool, then you're you're a person that's going to be healthy and in shape, and I'm not going to have to worry about sick days. Um, you know, I've had people tell me I like playing cards. I'm like, that kind of makes sense because you know it's a it's a calculation, and that's what we do in cyber. So those are those are just the, like you know generic questions, but they're also kind of open the candidate up a little bit and make them feel a little bit more comfortable. So when they get hit with some of the technical questions, they're not so ramped up, they're not so worried. Uh, because we're showing that we do actually care about you as a human being and as a person, not just a number and a employee. Yep. Colin, any bad questions you can think of? Think of that you Yeah. So kind of uh, echoing some of what Derek shared, I'm a big, or I absolutely hate the, the question, tell you that yourself. I think it's vague. I think it often paralyzes the person being interviewed. They're trying to wreck their brain and come up with a perfectness of birth personal anecdotes as well as professional experience and I think as a recruiter in a phone screen or a hiring manager in the actual face-to-face interview you really need to be mindful of your candidate's time that they have obligations that they may be put on pause that day to come spend time with you you have your resume they have your resume and so it's really just a snapshot of you as a professional and I think there's an obligation on both the recruiter as well as the hiring managers to have to dig deeper into that resume and ask some pointed questions and so if that's from a personality perspective like Derek shared or if you want to get into the technical or situational that Leela shared you just need to make sure that you have those baked out and that you're moving through the process quickly so that you get what you need to make a fair assessment of that candidate. Yeah, I would add on to that too. Yes or no questions, right? You want to, you want yeah. to have open ended questions. Mm-hmm. Answer. Exactly. So, um, what about the one question, Lila? You kind of already went through this. Like, what's your biggest accomplishment, or what's the project that you worked on? But what about the one question you do ask in every interview? Um, well, I have two actually. Okay. I realized actually. The one would be. Uh, it's sort of a, so I, I dislike the what are your strengths weaknesses because I think you get people to say they're perfectionists or whatever. Um, we can't all be perfectionists. Um, so the question, the, the spin on that, that I would use is what can you tell me about the last piece of constructive feedback that you received and what you did with it? Mm-hmm. And I find that even though it's just a subtle spin on the, you know, what are your weaknesses and what could you improve, people actually seem to sit back and think about it and delve into some very real feedback that they got. Um, so I get from that not only where could they improve their game, but also how did they react to it? What did they learn from it? Did they do anything different? Um, and also, it, it gives me a little glimmer. If they are not humble, that question sometimes gives me a glimmer of, of that lack of humility, which um, is a characteristic that I think we value here at the lever. Um, and then the other one that I suppose semi-obviously is I always ask them what questions they have for me, because I actually think that the question, the quality of question at the end is also a very telling uh, piece of insight into the candidate. How they're thinking about the opportunity. Are they, are, you know, what's motivating them? What do they really care about? How are they evaluating lever as a place to work? And so uh, I do listen pretty closely to those. And I don't, um, I don't like it when a candidate, even if I'm the third or fourth person in an interview panel, I don't like it when the candidate says, yeah, all my questions will be answered. Because I mean, this is a pretty serious life decision, right? You're making a decision potentially about uh, you know joining an organization, and it's a two-way discussion. We're interviewing you, but you're also trying us on for size. And if you truly can't think of a single thing you want to ask me as the head of the department, then I, I begin to question how how much research you've done, how truly interested in the, in the opportunity you are. So those are yeah. my two. Yeah, I totally agree yeah. with that. That's, that's that's my last question. Is usually is. What can I tell you about my company that you don't think you know? 
Mm-hmm. Um, because if they tell me they're like, if they ask, I had one individual, he literally pulled out a, just a piece of paper with questions and he had, like, he wanted to know a little bit more about health benefits, which I knew he was going to talk about because I knew that was his motivating factor. So we brought in HR. Uh, and now we actually foster that. We actually have HR come in and meet with a candidate before even the hiring manager comes in to go over our benefits package, just so they can know what uh, and you know pricing and so on and so forth. Because that's huge. Uh, you know, in this day and age, there's you know, with people with families that are paying six, seven, eight hundred dollars a month in insurance. Um, you know, if they can lower that price and get more money on the salary, then you know that's, that's another self for me. So I, I agree with Leo. I want to know what do you know about us. What do you, you know, have you done your homework? Have you done your research? Have you, you know, I mean, that tells me the level of expectation that you have for us as much as I have for you. So uh, I'll share a, a question that I've since stolen from a foreman manager, but I was being interviewed by my manager before my one currently, and he asked me, what do you read? What do you read to say abrupt to in your industry? How are you keeping pulse on marketing or employment branding in terms of trends that are evolving? And so from a recruiter perspective, if you're interviewing a recruiter, you would at the very least expect them to read recruiting blogs or uh, a blog centered around the functions they support. And so if someone doesn't have a response to how they're staying abreast of their industry, whether it's through a news source or a networking opportunity or some type of involvement in their industry, to me it signals that you really aren't as interested in advancing that particular field, that you don't have someone of a more personal vested interest versus just your nine to five. So yeah. I agree. If you're a recruiter, you should be reading, reading uh, Recruiting Daily. Recruiting <laughs> daily. I'm gonna throw that out there. This is the R. Shameless plug. Sorry about that. Listen to NHROA. NHROA, absolutely. Very nice. That was a plan. So, wow. Um, so going back to Holland, I want to talk about how these bad interview questions can actually impact your employer brand. Um, yep. They add up, right? So what, what's your thought? I mean, you're an expert in this space. What are your thoughts on how, how this can actually impact overall your, your reputation? Yeah, so I'll speak to you about the question that I shared. So like I said, tell me about yourself signals to me that you didn't do your homework on me as a candidate, and, and I don't think that's fair. I think that candidates are expected to perform a lot of research on the company. They're expected to have a list of follow-up questions prepared. However, I feel that the recruiter, as well as the hiring manager, should share this obligation. An interview shouldn't be just a straight question and answer session. It shouldn't just be diving into your resume. It should really be a two-way dialogue in order for that dialogue to take place, the, the hiring manager or the recruiter really needs to do their homework as well. So if a candidate uh, feels dismissed or not so, a bad, a bad interview is not going to turn your employment ban overall. However, if there is a trend of these negative experiences and they're not addressed through coaching or through metrics, um, word of mouth is going to spread a negative interview experience may pop up on Glassdoor or something that they've shared on social media. And so it's not the single instance that's going to really tarnish your employment brand. It's that compounding effect and not taking action to rectify it moving forward that's going to really hurt your employment brand moving forward. Um, I read a statistic actually from a Glassdoor survey that said 69% of people would not take a job with a company that had a bad employer or that had a bad reputation. So it's a pretty compelling statistic. Um, mm-hmm. Kind of along the same vein, <clears throat> Leela, how do you think that um, the interview process? How do you? It, it, it's kind of, you know, it's part of the employer brand. How does it also play into company culture? Well, um, at any place I will ever want to work, it definitely plays into company culture. Hell yeah. Um, and I think that's because, uh, you know, I'm somewhat wearing my uh, Silicon Valley hat here, but really in any competitive talent market, uh, talent has to be a top company priority and it has to be embedded in the culture. And so uh, I think there is a sort of an obligation for um, hiring managers to really own um, you know, own their part, or at least co-own the interview experience with uh, the recruiting team. And, you know, there's a ch- chance for recruiting to get them there. Um, so I think that, uh, first of all, you know, it's important for teams to really prioritize interviewing and, uh, you know, hiring as part of their overall culture. Uh, but then secondly, 
Um, the way it feeds back into culture, of course, my, my good friend Ron Storm over at Lyft, uh, with, uh, he's fond of telling me that your culture is basically your last 50 to 100 hires. And so every interview that you're in is an opportunity for you to uh, really add, you know, embellish, add in, in great ways to your company culture. It's not just about preserving it and maintaining it, it's really about each person that you bring into the mix somehow contributing to your culture and making it even more outstanding. And so um, you have to see the interview process as part of the company culture or part of your company culture because. Um, if you get it wrong, it's going to detract from your culture. So it really does um, really feed into a better culture overall. And um, going back to Lyft, they're one example of a company I know where the questions, even in the interview, are very aligned with their with their uh, value pillars. So they have four different pillars, and one of them is really around teamwork and collaboration, much the same as Lever. Um, but they actually listen out for uh, interviewees talking about projects with I, 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 and, and really not acknowledging the team or the we in the discussion, and for them that's the flag that the individual perhaps isn't the right uh, fit for this organization because they're not necessarily culturally aligned with that collaborative uh, team spirit. And so uh, I think it really is important to look at your interview process and your questions and make sure that somewhere along the way you're asking the right types of questions to help you understand whether that candidate is going to be aligned with the organization that you're part of, and also, as I said, not just aligned with it, but hopefully going to contribute to it in a meaningful way. Um, one question that we have in all of our interview feedback forms here at Lever is really um, this question of, would this person, would you trust this person to make the right decisions for Lever? Um, because as a small, rapidly growing company, we are definitely, um, you know, in the habit of making sure that people are empowered to make decisions, and it's absolutely vital that we bring in people that are uh, comfortable with ambiguity, that are able to make decisions uh, that we think are in the best interest of the company. And so, again, it's sort of like you need to get to the facts that will help you understand if that person is going to contribute to the culture, and that's across the entire interview uh, cycle. So it's something you need to really instill in each each person who is part of that process. Um, so I'm going to take a second here and do a little lever plug. I think we have a slide to, uh, to support this, Katrina. Um, so, you know, we heard earlier today from Derek saying that the logistics of an interview can really impact the candidate experience. We're hearing the types of questions, consistency. We just heard uh, Leela talk about feedback forms. We just wanted to to talk to you a little bit about improving interviewing with lever, how the technology can help support you know, throughout this entire process. If you can see the slide that Katrina is sharing um, on the left-hand side there, you'll see how Lever does interview scheduling. So you can get, you know, an entire panel on the same page, avoid, Derek, what you talked about, people being late, everybody knows where they're supposed to be, when they're supposed to be there. Um, you know, very easy to do that with Lever technology. And then on the right-hand side, um, again, when it comes to actually setting up your interviewers for success, making sure that you're preparing them with the questions you want them to be asking, what insights you want them to be pulling out. Um, you can see an example of a feedback form and a scorecard um, right in lever. So you know, you're able to, as a recruiter or a hiring manager, set up your entire team for success. So that's our lever plug. And now we'll get back to the, the panel on the last couple of questions here. Um, Derek, I wanted to ask you, um, do you actually need a huge budget you know, to be able to deploy some of these tactics and strategies that everyone's talking about. I mean, we have you know large enterprise um, company with Holland, we have small, you know, smaller startups here with with Leela. But like, what what kind of budget do we need to be able to do this, or do you even need a budget to be able to do some of these things? I think you you always need a budget, but I think it's it's more than a budget. It's an ROI. It's a return on investment. Um, I've always said if the product is going to help retain or save or make possibly make me money, then it's something I'm definitely going to look in and invest in. Lever is a perfect example. Um, I was just, I was smiling because I was thinking back, I, I know that uh, I've been in this business too long that, you know, we use, we use Microsoft's Outlook, you know, email tool and it's a schedule and you can schedule it and so on and so forth. But however, if you're international or even national, we're a national company. I mean, we're not big, but we have offices on both coasts. To set up an interview in California from Virginia, it can get it can get really wonky because when you send the email, it's not necessarily going to the other person's email, and everybody's like, "What am I supposed to be interviewing? Um, what am I supposed to be?" And that's for the candidate too. 
Uh, that's even for me. I'm a perfect example. I actually sent an email to Katrina last night saying, are we, uh, are we meeting at, at 2 or at, at 11? And it comes through my like Outlook.com, and I'm completely confused. Because it doesn't take Microsoft's never been able to take in time stamp uh, dates easily. So if this is a tool, for example, and I, I don't, and, and and for credit is going to do, I we don't have lever, but I'm going to be looking into it um, because it's a tool. I think that we could we could we could we could make a sustainable tool. With, um, I've always said, and Doug, who's our director here, uh, if we can, I I never just say I want this. Um, so recruiters, listen to Uncle Derek. If you want something, <laughs> show the return on the investment. Uh, don't just say I want this tool because it's cool. There's lots of cool mm-hmm. tools. There's lots of cool tools that are free. But there's also ones that you pay for. And you have to show the reason why. This is going to help save uh, our, our time and energy for our managers because, you know, they're working hard. Uh, they take have to take some time off-site and come to the corporate headquarters to do an interview. And if they come here and then... They're like, wait a minute, I thought the interview was a one and it's actually a two. That's a, that's a dead hour for them. You're not going to have a happy manager. And the manager's going to go in not happy at the interview level. So now the candidate's going to have a bad experience. Or a candidate shows up an hour early because they thought they were late. It, it's just all these little, it's just a little, once again, I started out with this and I'll end with this. It's the, it's the minutia. It's the little details that we need to look at a lot better than when we do and to not take it granted. That's just my opinion. So no, I don't think you need. A, I think you need a budget, but I don't think you need a ton of money. I think you just need how to spend your money wisely, and it'll it'll show in the end. Yeah, it's interesting to hear your feedback, Derek, and thanks, thanks for feedback on Lever. I mean, we're, we're a full-blown applicant tracking system with um, CRM functionality, but it's interesting how many times when people are talking about the benefit they get from our, our product, it comes back to the simple things like scheduling. So I agree. I mean, I think you, I think you get a big return in terms of the productivity of your team when you're using any sort of technology, whether it's ours or otherwise, just to, to keep, you know, to be able to work faster and more productively around uh, the simple things like scheduling. Yeah, I mean, like I said, interviewing is, Interviewing is stressful enough for everybody. Like there, there is no class to become a professional interviewer, right? You, you only want to interview once or twice and hopefully have the same job for, for a number of years. So to, anything that you can do to make that person for both the candidate experience and, you know, the manager and recruiter experience, I think is just as important by doing that, by, by having good scheduling tools uh, in, in place that alleviates just a little bit of stress from the actual interview itself. You know, I, I just, I, I'm just a really big proponent of that because I think if everybody comes in and they're comfortable, you're going to really get to know who that person is and they're going to get to know who your company is. And that's how you make the best hires. One thing I would say is a lot of what we've been talking about today, is less about a financial investment and a monetary budget. budget right? So mm-hmm. I, I, I'll wait through that if you're tuning into this webinar, it may be because things are less than, ideal when it comes to setting up interviews at your organization. And you have to convince your hiring managers and the rest of the organization that it's time well spent being better prepared for interviews and being able to get to the right candidates faster and then hopefully increasing the, your offer acceptance rate because you deliver that great experience. And so the hypothetical, I mean, the, you know, the, the experiment you'd love to run, of course, is, is um, you know, how much time is it taking for you to hire the right person? How many engineering hours is it taking? To hire the right person, and if you can bring that number down by a better, uh, more, uh, uh, more sophisticated and more, um, more, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Just really effective interviewing uh, strategy. Then the savings to your company in terms of engineering matters. I mean, that's that's significant, right? So you know, it, it's not necessarily about dollars, but it is about time, and, and you really owe it to your candidates and to your organization to find that time mm-hmm. as well. Holland, um, I guess last, last, we'd love to hear from you last on this, because um, you, it sounds like at cost you have, you know, a lot of materials that you're rolling out and a lot of time spent. Mm-hmm. I mean, what are your thoughts on the budget question? Yeah, I, I, I think I definitely echo more on the Leela side. And so Cox is a really layered organization. There's a lot of hands in the pot. And so I think as your organization grows and you do have a lot of resources, um, not only do you need to track ROI to Derek's 
point of those investments. There also needs to be some governance. So what maybe was working um, this time last year, it, it may be stale, it may be dated. So there just needs to be a time investment, not only improve the process, but make sure that the materials and the philosophies that you're putting in practice in your organization are actually panning out, um, whether that's through offer conversion or if, if you are really deep into metrics and you're tracking performance of those hires long term and how they're contributing to the organization. So I just think finding the time to add some governance layers to your process really will go a long way in the long run. Awesome. Well, okay, guys, thank you so much. This has been a really great discussion. I know we wanted to leave some time at the end here uh, to go through questions that some of the viewers might have. So Katrina, um, I will pass it over to you, but thank you again to our panelists. This has been really interesting and, and informative, I think, uh, for everybody on this call. But let's hear from let's hear from the audience. Yeah, we have a ton of great questions. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I love this audience. You guys have done a great job. We'll just start from the top. Uh, a question from Jennifer. How do you deal with difficult hiring managers who want to do things their way and not consider new or better ways of interviewing? And I would love for Holland to answer this because you're kind of embedded uh, with a lot of people and managing a lot of personalities, mm -hmm. I imagine. Yeah, so um, a lot of what we hear in the service delivery side is that managers do have opinions and I do like doing things their way. And so for our recruiters to really be successful, they have to have really strong alliances with HR um, to help kind of curb those back. And so the recruiters are they're trying to check some boxes. They're, they're trying to bring in the best candidates and make sure that the hiring manager has the appropriate template to do that. However, they, they really are trying to fill some areas from a compliance perspective, um, as well as just some internal requirements. And so for us, really leveraging your partners and, and helping the hiring managers understand Stand the the reason behind the rhyme, I think goes a long way in terms of getting them to adopt a current day process. How about you, Derek? How do you deal with hiring managers who are stuck in their ways? Um, so it's a really good question, and I, you know, unfortunately, I've run into it before. Um, I'm a big fan of using history. Um, so being a government contractor, where we have another set of rules, which is OFCCP on top of the EEOC, lots of uh, lots of fun letters, and uh, I've gone back and I've, I've shown, uh, I've dug up articles, and I do a, a lunch and learn with my managers or new managers, and I explain to them, you know, you could go to jail if you if you, if you don't. Do He's the threatening right thing. you with jail time. That's his official answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm um, it's true. It's like you know, it's like it, you can cost you a contract. It can cost you a contract vehicle. It can cost you a great deal of money, um, and which in turn could also cost you your job. So you know, there's a there's a, a way of doing things and and best practice. And I bring an HR with me and we talk about it because I'm I mean, coming from a recruiting standpoint. There's lots of things I'd like to ask that I can't, and, I, and I'm not going to. But uh, to, to make sure that you, you get your manager to buy in, the other thing I always tell my manager is, you know, you are my partner in this. We're not, I don't work for you. I work for the company. Uh, you and I are partners, and our job is to fill the position so that the company makes money. So the best way to do that is by doing best practice. And I don't have a manager, I think I've ever had a manager that hasn't said, okay, and, and listened to me pretty well, but, you know, I can be kind of overbearing, so... Uh, Lila, we got a question just for you. <laughs> <laughs> if I can just um, you know, you know, one thing on that. So while I, while I find it very hard to believe that any hiring manager is ever difficult, um, I would say that um, I would encourage the recruiters to find, find the uh, places where these hiring managers come together, crash the marketing mm -hmm. all that, and use that as a platform for showcasing best practices. So someone else on the team is uh, deploying new techniques and fresher ways of getting to the right campus and it's working, share those success stories with the organization, champion their efforts, and it's hard to ignore that because at the end of the day, as a hiring manager, you definitely are feeling the pain if you're not filling that seat as quickly as you'd like to. So just find ways to get in front of them and show how it can be done. Yeah. So, Lila, we actually had a question from Jessica about your favorite question, about the last piece of constructive feedback. Uh, how might you adapt that question for a junior candidate who may not have a 
constructive feedback from a last boss answer? Well, I mean, I think you can always, I guess it depends on how junior they are. Um, I, I still think you can look for most candidates that you're going to interview, even if they are just, you know, graduating from college or coming into an internship, are going to have been involved in uh, sports teams or uh, class projects or something else where they're interacting in situations that simulate uh, like a team environment or some other situation where they have a coach or a teacher or someone else. So I think you can still adapt the question, just be more flexible in the type of answer that you're going to get, um, because it may not be a strictly a work situation, uh, but it will still inform how they process feedback, how well they listen, uh, and you know what they do to, to improve uh, the way they go forward. So I still think it's balanced. You might just have to think a little bit more about um, the types of scenario that you give them as an example. Responses. Yeah, maybe coaching them on the framing of the question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, Holland, a question for you. You know, you said like candidate preparing, you know, candidate documents to help them prepare for the interview. How would you mm-hmm. adapt that if, it, if you were only hiring new college grads? I actually think that that would be even maybe a stronger audience than some of the people that we're preparing our guides for. And so our target audience for the guides that I was referencing are really more of our hourly employees, so individuals who are in our retail locations or our call centers. And so I would say new grads somewhat fall into that framework in terms of they've never been exposed to a star interview approach before. They've never been um, in a situation where they've they've had behavioral type questions asked from their way. And so preparing a, hey, this is your first first job, here are things to expect from point A to point Z, I think would go a long way for someone from uh, coming from campus or right into maybe their first career. Awesome. Uh, so we got a question from Regina, who's actually new to recruiting. Welcome to recruiting and welcome to the summer. Uh, and she would love to know just some additional resources to keep, you know, on top of recruiting techniques and resources. I know we all have our, have our favorite. Um, and we mentioned mm-hmm. some earlier, but maybe if you each have one more that you really love, what are you explaining what <laughs> SROS is? I see the shirt. Love. The shirt is ready. Yeah. <laughs> what are you explaining what that is? Oh, sure. I Regina doesn't know what it is, right? <laughs> oh, actually, okay, two things. Two things. I would be remiss if I did not mention the letter blog. So it's just letter mm-hmm. slash blog. And we're publishing original content two or three times a week. And it's mm-hmm. really very focused on best practices. Um, so today there's actually one that to have the phone screen effectively. So go check that out. I will now put on the t-shirt for Lars. And I'm going to do it. <laughs> so this is a t-shirt for um, something called uh, Open Source HR. Uh, the hashtag on Twitter is HROS. And this is a movement started by some uh, really phenomenal folks in the space, uh, Lars Schmidt and Ambrosia. Um, and um, really what it is is a community that is coming together to just openly share best practices what's working and what's not. So if you go check out the hashtag on Twitter, that will lead you to their website where they actually post full blown case studies from organizations on everything from uh, mm-hmm. measuring metrics and, and uh, some analytics to diversity and inclusion, et cetera, et cetera. So those would be my two tips. Eric? Uh, obviously, Recruiting Daily, is, I've already mentioned it. I think it's, it's really great. Um, another one, though, uh, I would recommend would be um, Black Belt, Julian Black Belt by mm-hmm. Glenn Cathy. Uh, mm-hmm. He writes some pretty amazing stuff. I, I'm really, I've always been really impressed. In fact, he's the one that kind of got me into Boolean years ago uh, and learning how to do Boolean search streams and things like that. And he's just, he's a great mentor and teacher. Um, I'm trying to think. Those are, that's pretty much, those are pretty much my go-tos. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got one more, but I have to look it up. So if, move, I'll come back to it. Yeah, All right. Well, I'll come back. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I will second the plug on HROS, also throughout the full talent. But I would also say me look inside your organization as well and look for some shadowing opportunities. If you are uh, tracking conversion metrics and you have a hard manager who is doing well or, or just from candidate feedback, someone who maybe expressed that, hey, this is an outstanding interview, I've never experienced an interview like this before, I would ask to shadow um, that particular person and, and just gather some of their best practices and, and see if you can expand them more broad based within your organization. Awesome. 
Um, a question from Amy, and I actually volunteered there to answer this. Sorry, buddy. Uh, not even sorry. We're going to answer it. Uh, and you. Do you have a, what's your go-to question for a call center candidate? She's doing 50 interviews a week, and she needs to make the good ones stand out. And if anyone else has an answer, go for it. But I just decided I was going to put Derek on the spot. Hey, I have to go back to my uh, call center days back when I was at Geico. I'm sure I remember the question that we would always I knew ask. you'd have one. And I always ask, um, well, it's not so much a question. I did a, I used to, one of the things that I would do was an actual role play. Um, I'd give them kind of the script that we would use. But what I was really looking for them is, especially in an inside sales role, uh, I want to see how quick you are on your feet when you get asked some oddball question. Um, like, you know, how would you respond to somebody saying, you know, asking you a question that isn't normally something that's going to be on, you know, like on your call sheet, on your, on your, on your go-to. So it shows me that they think outside the box a little bit, especially I want a salesperson to be able to do that. So my recommendation is always like, you know, I would put them, give them a, a phone and we're just, you know, say, Hey, I'm going to call ring ring and uh, have a list of oddball questions and see how they, see if they laugh, see if they just brush it off, you know, see if they get frustrated. Um, I think so, and you want to have high energy when you're in a, in a phone center environment like that. And you want someone that is not afraid of the phone and, and not afraid of ha being able to, to pick up on a question or not. Cool. Also, another uh, good site to go look at is intrepidnow.com. There we go. Um, question for you, Holland, is kind of an employer branding expert. Uh, any tips on how to sell the value of a good candidate experience to a hiring manager who just doesn't get it? So I think it just goes back to ROI. I think Derek really hit the nail on the head when you, you really need to build your business case. And so uh, a, a good example or, or how you would start that with a hiring manager who's maybe um, – lacking in their candidate experience is to, one, just kind of track those numbers. So how many candidates are, are they bringing in? What is that conversion rate? How many people are actually accepting that offer? Um, and then I would gain permission maybe from your leader or whatever uh, HR permissions that you need to, to start doing some informal um, just screens of those candidates. I would I would assume some organizations, um, I would hope, are following up with candidates and just asking them about their general experience of the interview overall from a pulse check perspective. Uh, maybe if you have a hiring manager who is, is particularly speaking out in terms of lacking on the experience side, track them a little bit more closely and build more of a broad-based um, case to help them understand where those deficiencies may lie in their process. And awesome. so, oh, sorry. No, I'm saying if if you if you need a, uh, some some tips, I, I know Leela mentioned, or maybe with Jack actually that referenced the Glassdoor stat. So Glassdoor has a lot of just uh, great statistics and some case studies already established. So if you don't feel comfortable building one from scratch, you can certainly find some on the web that may be parallel to your current situation. Awesome. Uh, so this is a quick roundabout answer. So we have one minute left. Yes or no? Should candidates be given the questions before they come to the interview? Leela. Uh, um, I think it was no. She's <laughs> yeah, like, no. Colin. <laughs> I don't think they should be given the question before they come to the interview. However, if you have a particularly grueling process or um, if you, as a recruiter, identified something in their initial phone screen that you think really stood out to you and that you think the hiring manager is looking for or will want to see in the interview, I don't think there's anything wrong with, one, coaching them through your overall process, giving them someone of the lay of the land, and then making sure to call out those specific points that you think will go a long way with the hiring manager. If you're confident, they are your gold medalist. There's a difference between prepping a candidate and then giving a candidate questions. Um, I like I prep my candidates. I tell them what to expect, who mm -hmm. they're meeting with. I, but I'm not going to I'm not going to have the I'm not going to give them like tech questions from, because you know in, in my in, in cyber field they can just run to a book or go to you know Bing or Google or something and download the information. It's kind of I'm not going to get the real answer from them. That's kind of the whole point mm -hmm. of a face to face interview is to is to is to get 
that real person, not someone that's prepped. All right. So that wraps up our interview. I am actually typing right now the resources that were mentioned. Uh, you can all turn off your cameras real quick uh, at, because we had some questions uh, as far as what those URLs were. So I'm going to put them on the screen. Um, is a leather blog. Uh, and we'll have that as part of the recording. I hope everyone can see that. I apologize if it's small and kind of working on the fly here. Um, but I will make sure that they're also part of an email that goes out after this. And if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can reach us at Recruiting Blog. I am at Katrina Kibben, and I hope all of you have a wonderful Tuesday. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to all of our panelists, of course. Thank you. Thanks so much.